Hi, welcome to our online service. God bless you. It's so great to have you with us today. It is. We're going to have communion together this morning, so grab your little cup and biscuit and get ready. Get everybody together right now. If you're with the family, bring your chairs, the things together, set up around the TV, the computer, whatever you're watching on today, because this is our online church service. Woo-hoo. We're going to start today by praising the Lord. Yeah. And this first song is about making a hallelujah sound, no matter what you feel like, no matter what you've been going through, it's always time to raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah to the
Hallelujah! It's always right to praise the Lord. It is. What's been going on this week? Well, this week we've continued work on the stage and the sound deadening. Work just continues to happen around the building. What an amazing group of people. And I have it on good authority yes. that there's been some more work going on in the church. There has. What's been happening? The doors are being worked on. We're getting glass within the, the doors down the back so your children are safe. Let's have a look. Okay, here we are, the next step of our, our renovations. We're putting glass, going to put glass in the door to the crash in the storeroom, and they'll end up looking like this. It's a bit of work, but it'll be well worth it. And this is the part way. They've got the beading off, which takes quite a while, and then they've got to cut out the panels. Which before, takes another quite a while. Before we send it down to the glass place where they'll put in the glass and then it'll be back. So please pray for us that it can be done quicker. We're doing it uh, for safety's sake. It'll increase visibility. It'll also increase light in the passageway just as a, a little extra. Thanks, Graham and Caroline. So what's happened this week? <laughs> Exciting news. This week <laughs> we have had the great news that we can open up and have up to 10 people outdoors. Now that's progress. We can meet together. So we're going to have men's fellowship and people are already talking about getting together with friends and having some fellowship meetings with up to 10 people outside. So men's fellowship, Wednesday afternoon, I think it's three o'clock. So that's going to be at Andrew's house, outdoors of course. And what else has been happening this week? I went to a Zoom meeting on so, Wednesday night. So did I. It was one for the whole church. It was. It was good. We want to encourage you today, get your thinking caps on, let's start praying and let's believe for more outdoor fellowships to spring up all around the place so that we can get together yeah. and really invest some time in fellowship and in the Word of God, at praying together yeah. and seeing a move of God. Let's continue to connect where and when we can. Because with God, nothing, nothing is, is impossible. impossible. It's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible Through you blind eyes are open Strongholds are broken I am living by faith Nothing is impossible
things Cause it's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible to you Blind eyes are open Strongholds are broken I'm living my faith Nothing is impossible Seasons of peace are totally different than seasons of war. Right now, we are in a season of war. Yes, we are at war. In a season of peace, we can get away with a lot. We can expect, even demand, extra comfort, extra luxuries, without much thought about the cost. There's no real lack. In times of peace, we don't really respect leaders, as the urgency of what they say is not really appreciated. We don't feel we are in a place of danger, so there's no need to respond to their urgent pleas. In times of peace, the church is in danger of becoming a place of entertainment, comfort, and perhaps even self-gratification. But we are in a time of war. This is a time for action. We must advance. We will advance our doors before us. Together. We will advance our doors before us. In a time of war, you cannot act like it is peacetime. If we don't follow wartime strategies, we will get hurt. We need to break out of sleepiness. We need to break out of comfort zones. In times of war, we have to take on a whole different attitude. Bible, Joshua had to break the cycle of 40 years of walking in circles with no advancement. It was just an existence of survival. The Israelites had to advance out of the wilderness and enter into the battleground. This takes putting on a whole new attitude, a whole new mentality. The attitude in the promised land is that we need to be a conqueror. We need to conquer. This is now a time to fight. This is now a time to advance. The biggest danger in this is that if we do not define our enemy at this time, we will use the determination to fight on the wrong people. If we don't know who we are fighting, we will fight each other. We will put our energies into wrong places. When we know we are in a fight and we feel all the internal conflict and turmoil, sometimes we are left with a sense of wanting to hit out to protect ourselves because we know we are under attack but our energies are misplaced. Or, on the other hand, we feel so overwhelmed that we just want to distract ourselves from the pain. In an army, there are strategic leaders, battle plans, and are working together to fight the same enemy. Touching.
need to handle this season of transition with a battle plan so that we don't go to war with each other. This is not a time to criticise. It is a time to encourage one another. We are facing a long war. It is not going to be over quickly. We are going to be together in the trenches for some time. When we are encouraged, we can stand up and fight. We need encouragement when facing great warfare. It's very hard to fight and keep fighting. We need every bit of strength to fight the real enemy. If we fight with despair, we lose. We need to encourage one another. This is not a time to fight each other. This is a time to fight together against the same enemy. A time to encourage one another so that we can stand strong against our enemy. Encouragement infuses our physical frame with strength. Your whole being is strengthened when you are encouraged. Yes, we all make mistakes, but this is a time to encourage people with their strengths. It is time to think like an army. It's time to advance. It is not a time to take independent actions. In times of confusion, there can come a clash and it is hard to define the enemy. Be careful not just to swing the sword around to protect yourself and hurt others that get in your way. Because we can hurt others in the process. We need to band together to fight the right enemy. Define who the enemy is. It is not against flesh and blood that we fight, but principalities and powers. We need to unite together become cheerleaders of our team and fight the battle together so that we can take ground and advance. So keeping those thoughts in mind, let's take communion together. So it's time to get your emblems, get ready. Mm -hmm. Let's focus on this. The Bible says that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke, broke it. And he said, take, eat this in remembrance of me. This is my body broken for you. So in Jesus' name today, let's take the emblems. Thank you. And in the same night he was betrayed, Jesus took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you do it in remembrance of me. So let's drink the cup together and remember that it's an emblem that depicts the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us from sin and is a basis for the whole new covenant. So let's drink together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. The blood of Jesus also guarantees our access to God. And right now, God is a good God. He loves you. He loves people. He's made it possible for us all to receive healing and blessing and breakthrough. So today, let's open our hearts to Him and get ready for healing physically, emotionally, spiritually, and in every way possible. One of the things we want to focus on today is that we are well aware that people get hurt in churches. Along our journey in church life, we unavoidably get hurt from pastors, leaders and others. Today, I want to repent on behalf of all those that have hurt you, pastors, leaders and others. So in the name of Jesus, I confess before you that we pastors, leaders and significant people in church have done things to hurt you, to reject you, to overlook you and to make you feel less than you are. Please forgive us. Mm. We were wrong. And so today Rosanna is going to lead us in prayer for you to be healed right now. But I encourage you to let that hurt go. Mm. Forgive, be forgiven and receive forgiveness. Yes, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that people would receive that healing today. Healing 
from any hurts that have happened along their journey. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God who heals. And as you died on that cross, you took all the hurt, all the pain. And we thank you, Lord, for that healing right now in Jesus' name. There's somebody watching today and right across both wrists, the back of both wrists, you've been having an arthritic pain that comes there and bothers you. Sometimes it's more intense than others. But today, if you will lift those hands to God, I believe that as we pray, you will experience the power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the love of God. And in Jesus' name, I call that arthritic condition out of there and all of that Thank pain, I Thank bind it in the name of Jesus and I loose it from your body right now in Jesus' name. Be healed. In Jesus' name. I pray for someone who has a problem in their leg, in their calf. I declare healing right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Be healed. Someone with infection in the lungs and lung problems, I'm praying for that today. Be healed in Jesus' name. I command the lungs to clear, for the bronchial tubes to open, for all airways and air passages to be healed, to be strengthened, to be renewed. Because Psalm 103 says, He satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. If that's you today, take that and receive your healing. I pray for eye problems and I declare healing right now in the name of Jesus. All eye infection and all eye problems go in the name of Jesus. Healed right now. Jesus. Somebody's been having pain in the kidney region and I just speak to that kidney region right now and I command it to be healed. Mm -hmm. The kidneys, the adrenal glands and other things Thank in that area, Jesus. we claim complete healing for it right now. I'm seeing it the way I'm looking forward to be on the right hand side of the body. I see that healing just flowing right into that area right now. And as we pray, Father, we thank you for that complete healing, the inflammation to go down, the infection or whatever it is to cease and all the inoperational part of it to come back into full operation in Jesus name. And all back problems healed now in the name of Jesus, totally restored healed in Jesus name. Kidney stones now you dissolve and go in the name of Jesus. And Father I pray too for someone with gallbladder complaints and I pray Father now that in the name Thank of you. Jesus Thank any stones Jesus. in the gallbladder would just shrink away right now. Gallbladder stones be gone. Gallbladder function properly and I declare complete digestion the bile duct and everything working properly for the complete digestion of fats mm. and everything else that's associated with that in Thank Jesus you. name. Amen. So let's keep our heart open to God today. Keep receiving because we are now going to welcome the Holy Spirit.
Good morning, Church. It's time to think about it, what we would like to give to God. <clears throat> because we love Him and we want to, um, as we come, I've been really challenged this week on where's my heart in all this? Is it just giving? Because that's what I do every week. And I was really challenged by many stories in the Bible, but um, Achan in Joshua 7, and Moses and Sapphira in Acts 5, 1 to 11, really challenged me on where my heart is. If I give to people, if I give anything, really all I have is God's and I'm only giving back to him. And I challenged too that the church after Ananias and Sapphira had done the wrong thing. They were in awe of God. They realised how important it is to, with all of these, and Judas as well, um, all of these put put money ahead of truth and obedience to the Lord. And that's what we really need to be in all this, don't we? Truthful and obedient to what God tells us. Also, there are other stories in the Bible that are really good. And I think of the widow's might, she gave everything. Yes, she didn't have much to give, but she gave everything. Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus' story really touched me too. Zacchaeus, the guy who was a tax collector. I'd just like to read to you out of the Passion Bible in Luke 19. When Jesus got to that place, he looked up into the tree and he saw Zacchaeus. Hurry on down, for I am appointed to stay at your house today. So he scurried down the tree and came face to face with Jesus. As Jesus left to go with Zacchaeus, many in the crowd complained, look at this of all the people to have dinner with. He's going to eat in the house of a crook. Zacchaeus joyously welcomed Jesus and was amazed over his gracious visit to his home. Zacchaeus stood in front of the Lord and said, half of all that I own, I will give to the poor. And Lord, if I have cheated anyone, I promise to pay back four times as much as I stole. Jesus, must have smiled and said to him, this shows that today life has come to you and your household, for you are true son of Abraham, the son of man has come to seek and out and to give life to those who are lost. So what a wonderful way of joyous giving it is. And as we put God first in the stewarding of our money, he has entrusted to us. We confirm to the Lord and to the devil who we belong to. We belong to God. And because all that we have is God's, we joyously give back to you. Let's just pray. Father God, we just thank you for everything that you have given us. Our very life, our very breath is from you. And we just want to give back to you now what you want from us. Just touch our hearts as to what you want. We want to be willingly yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we are in the prayer room. And just a reminder, if you have any prayer needs, do feel very free to contact either the pastors or the elders so that we can support you in prayer. With God, there's no need to hide. And we're looking forward to being able to be released from all this lockdown. But in the meantime, we're praising God anyhow. Yeah, God bless you all. Our chains are gone, our dead 
is paid, the cross has overthrown the grave for Jesus' blood that sets us free means death to death and life for me. The innocent judge guilty. The guilty one walks free Death would be his portion And our portion liberty How to Overcome the Unseen Enemy When I was starting my high school years, the other boys that used to be at school with me travelled in by train and I can remember some of the boys from Bunyip saying to me, when they went past the post office in the morning, because they didn't like the man that ran the post office, they interfered with his very important work for the weather bureau because he had a rain gauge and he would go out in the mornings and record exactly how much rain was in his rain gauge and then send it to the weather bureau and because they didn't like him they would come past and if it was a wet night and been raining all night had you know six inches in the old scale they would take the rain gauge and empty all the water out of it and put it back but if it had been a dry night they would take the hose and fill it up so by the time he got to work it was reading a wrong reading because he had an unseen enemy. As a result of the surreptitious work of the unseen enemy, he was probably made the laughing stock at the Weather Bureau. The significance of his work was lost, his scientific accuracy, and his, even his job would have been called into question because he had an unseen enemy that he had never seen and did not know how to fight it 
because he just couldn't see it and didn't even know it was there. So today we're talking about how to overcome your unseen enemy because whether we like to admit it or not, we do have one and he is evil. So we're going to read today the book of Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 and it says they overcame him, speaking of the devil, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives unto death. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word today, we're asking that you would fill us and flood us with your spirit of wisdom and revelation, the eyes of our understanding being enlightened by your spirit, that we might know not only the things freely given to us by God, but the power to us who believe, but also have a revelation of exactly what we're involved with in the spirit realm. Recently, I was listening to a man preaching who testified of having been to heaven. And he said the atmosphere in heaven was so clean but Jesus sent him back because he still had more work to do. He said when he came back, it was like coming back to a haunted house because he began to realize just how prevalent the enemy is, how evil, how wicked, and how many of them there are. And we need to overcome them and to deal with them. And I'll give you some scriptures for this. So one thing's for sure that those that don't overcome when it comes to eternal rewards, they're going to miss out. Listen to Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. The fearful, the unbelieving, will have their part in the lake burning with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. But for overcomers, the Bible has a completely different scenario painted out here. And it's in the seven letters to the seven churches and again at the end. So Revelation chapter 21 verses 6 and 7 says, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God and he will be my son. I'm reading here from Revelation chapter 21 verse 7 where it says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God and he will be my son. And then seven more times in the book of Revelation, and I'll give you some of the scriptures for this, but it's all found in Revelation 2 and 3, where it says, To him that overcomes, I'll give to eat of the tree of life. He who overcomes shall in no way be harmed by the second death. To him who overcomes, I will give him some of the hidden manna to eat, and I'll give him a white stone. Amen. And then in Revelation 2, 26, it says, He who overcomes and he who keeps my works till the end, I'll give authority over the nations, and I'll give him the morning star. Revelation 3, 5, He that overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and by no means shall I erase his name from the book of life but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. This is for overcomers. Another one, Revelation 3.12. He that overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And I'll write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. Jesus speaking. And Revelation chapter 3 verse 21. He that overcomes, I'll grant him to sit with me on my throne. Amen. These are the rewards for overcomers. Jesus is looking for those that will overcome. He came to this earth on a mission from his Father, a mission to use the gospel to restore all created reality and particularly all humans to himself. But there is a vast quantity of enemies in this planet working against Jesus' plan and they're working against you and they're working against me. And the best thing to do is not deny they're there. You know, my father's generation had a saying, if you don't talk about the devil, he won't bother you. That's not in the Bible. That is a lie straight from the devil. The other saying they had was, the devil's what you make of him. 
In other words, if you talk about him and amplify him, he'll be worse. But the truth is, the devil is what the Bible says about him. And God reveals many things about the devil. And one we must never forget, that the day Jesus was baptized by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit led him, you could say on a very holy mission, straight into the wilderness to confront the devil. Because spiritual warfare is real. And I believe that if we'll give our attention to God's word right now, by the time we finish this message, you will know how to overcome an unseen enemy who is wicked beyond measure. About him, the Bible says in John 10:10, 10, 10, the thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it abundantly. There is a war going on. And in that scripture, the devil is mentioned first. In scripture, that's significant. Thankfully, after Jesus' resurrection, it mentions God's system first because it says in Romans chapter 8, it says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus made us free from the law of sin and death. So in that scripture, God's system is mentioned first. You have the upper hand. And so today, how do we overcome the works of the enemy? How do we overcome? Number one, we have to accept the reality, the nature and the tactics of our unseen enemy. First, we look at his character, which is absolute pernicious wickedness and evil beyond the description of English words. And it says this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So the one we're wrestling is evil beyond description. This is not to make you frightened today. It's not to give you fear. And it's certainly not to give you nightmares because if you don't fight him, you certainly will have all of those things inflicting you and you'll be defenseless. But you will learn from the word of God today how to stand up to this bully boy, worker of evil. He's a thief. He's a destroyer. He's a killer. You know, God is the one that said, you shall not kill. And yet a lot of times they blame God for things that kill people. The devil is a killer and you can overcome him. So let me say this again. You are in a wrestling match. Wrestling is personal. It's up close. It's not like some, you know, American drone is sent into a foreign country and sends down a guided missile and blows up something. That's not wrestling. Wrestling is up close. It's in your face. Now, to illustrate this, another story from when I was a young boy, first in high school, we had a lot of primary schools in our area, all little country ones, and I went to the local primary school and some of the others would come in. You know, there was Druin South, there was Ropeby, and there was other primary schools. And when we all got into high school, without any evil intent or without anybody getting hurt, we had wrestling matches with everybody. And you work it out, there's a lot of permutations and combinations there. We had to wrestle and wrestle each other just so that we could work out who was the strongest and develop a henpeck order. Nobody was hurt. Everybody was open to doing it. It was just something that boys did at that time. There was no hitting. There was no punching. We just wrestled to find out who was the strongest. And wrestling has an objective. When you wrestle someone, you wrestle them and force them to the ground. And when you can pin them down, you're the winner. So remember, you have an unseen enemy wrestling you every day. He's not physical, but he's wrestling. And his objective is to pin you into inactivity, pin you down to immobilize you and to render you ineffective in your life and in your service for God. Today, we're learning how to overcome him. But you must 
First of all, acknowledge that he's real. What's his tactics like? He uses deception. And you know, a lot of this is mental. It's in our mind. We know that our wrestle is not flesh and blood, but sometimes in our mind, he lines up with what our flesh nature, our old nature would like. But he uses deception, accusation, oppression. You know, sometimes you just feel oppressed, depressed. It's a work of the enemy. He brings temptation. The Bible clearly says no man is tempted by God. God does not tempt us with evil. He doesn't take over the devil's job. That's what the devil does. The devil can bring physical symptoms and sickness. In the Bible, there was a woman bowed over for 18 years and Jesus said, Ought not this woman whom Satan has bound for 18 years be loosed from this infirmity? So Jesus attributed that to the enemy. And it says in the book of Acts chapter 10 that Jesus went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So he was saying that sickness was an oppression of the devil. The devil can do all of those things. He can mess with the weather. He really can. We see that in the book of Job. When the devil went before God and demanded God move against Job, God didn't move against him. He said, Satan, he's in your hand. A lot of commentators believe that that was Job's own fault, that he was in Satan's hand. But often Satan attacks without a cause because God said that at the end, you move me against him without a cause. But as soon as Satan realized that Job was in his hand, there was an earthquake, there was a whirlwind, and there were crooks or criminals coming up. And this is what killed Job's family and his servants and his livestock. It was the devil messing with those things. Amen. Another of the devil's tactics is opposition to your dream and to your vision and to your service of God. He's working against you. Amen. An enemy is someone who weakens your influence with others. So he's an accusing voice in their ear. And I'm a leader. I am not unaware of how the devil can accuse people that are in a group I'm leading against me. It's just one of the facts. I have to fight against that and you have to fight against it too. And this certainly I'm going to mention it again. The enemy agrees and amplifies all the sins and temptations of the flesh. Number two, make sure you're clothed with God's armor. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 13, Finally, my brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. And it doesn't say there, take it off at night time. Put it on. Please keep it on that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Those wiles are his schemes, which are described here as fiery darts. For we do not wrestle. I'm going to read it again. Think about what this says. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. You know, there's a lot of people I've heard say over the 30 or so years that I've been a Christian. Actually, it's 38 years. A lot of them say, this is not a problem with the devil. This is your flesh. But that's not what the Bible says. It says we wrestle not against flesh. Yes, the devil will always line up with what your flesh wants. But if you live by the power of the spirit, you can put to death the deeds of the body. The wrestling match we have is against the enemy. And the enemy loves being a covert operator. So many of the lies he's perpetrated include things like this. There's no devils in this country. This is not the devil fighting you. This is your own flesh. It's your own mind. It's your own problem. That's not what this scripture says. Let's read it again. For we wrestle, right? We wrestle, but not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. See, they're organized, they're structured against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. They're in the spirit realm. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Now, the whole armor of God is mentioned twice in this passage. That means it's very, very important 
for you to make sure you've got that armor on. And we're going to mention it in point number three, which is defend yourself against the unseen enemy's weapons. So he says in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14 to 17, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all of the fiery darts of the wicked one. So our type of shield is more like the cork shield of a Roman soldier for capturing and extinguishing arrows that are alight. And so we are not here to reflect the darts of fire onto others, but to trap them in our shield and extinguish them. And it says, take the helmet of salvation. So we have a belt of truth. So to be armed against the enemies, we need to live by the truth. And remember Jesus said to his father in King James, thy word is truth. In other words, a definition of truth is God's word. And Jesus also said, I am the truth because he's the living word. So the truth is a living person. And that's what we tie it all together with. Amen. The breastplate of righteousness. This is protection for our vital organs and primarily our heart. It's in this area of the armor and this is righteousness. Righteousness has two parts. The theologians call it righteousness imputed and righteousness imparted. Righteousness imputed is just a fancy way for saying when you put your faith in Jesus, he attributes his track record to you and you are the righteousness of God in him without having done anything. It's the minute you get born again, you put your faith in Jesus and this can happen for you today if you're not born again. You become the righteousness of God. It's a lesson in itself. The righteousness of God. There is no greater righteousness. It's a free gift from God to you today. But righteousness imparted is when God's ability to overcome sin transforms you. And we've looked at that in previous weeks. But I want to encourage you today. God's power to overcome sin is yours. It's the Holy Spirit power and it's activated as you put your faith in God's great and precious promises so that by these you might become a partaker or partner in the divine nature. And the divine nature certainly does not sin. Amen. The next thing is the footwear in this armor. It's called having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace is just plain good news. For us humans, it's almost too good to be true. Most people think it is too good to be true. That God loves us that much. He wants family. He wants reconciliation because we were created to be part of him. We have his DNA. He loves you. Amen. But what we have to shod our feet with or put on the shoes of or the boots or the armory is preparation for the gospel. We always need to have that gospel on the tip of our tongue and take every opportunity to share the gospel. We have every opportunity to go with the gospel because we all know that shoes are for going. Amen. And when the lockdown's over, we're going to do some outreaches. We're going to go with the gospel. But you can go on the phone. You can go on social media. You can go to your friend's place. You can go to a lot of places with the gospel. So we've got to go with the gospel and not try to control people with it or manipulate them. Get that preparedness in your life. Make sure you know how to lead someone in the sinner's prayer. Make sure you know how to explain your testimony and lead someone through to salvation. We also have to have the shield of faith. Amen. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. According to Romans 10, 17, we've got to be in the word day and night. Meditate in the word of God day and night. Stay with it. We've got some great studies on Facebook. We've got some great teachings on YouTube. So keep yourself in the word of God. Read the Bible. 
Pray every day. Amen. In other words, it's like I always say, eat the word, sleep the word, think the word, say the word, preach the word, pray the word, meditate on the word, study the word, analyze the word, grow in the word, meditate on the word, memorize the word. You can sing it, shout it, say it and pray it. You can get it on an iPod, an iPhone, an iPad. You can get it in an eye. Well, you can't get it in an ice cream, but you should have it in your eyelids so that when you shut your eyes, you can see it happening. Amen. The word of God is is God, according to John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, which says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. So I'm encouraging you today. This is your shield. It's faith. And you know that when Jesus had to fight the devil, it doesn't matter what lie or attack the devil came with, he could answer it by his faith in God's Word. Okay, so that's the part one of this message on how to overcome the unseen enemy. The second part's going to be coming up. Right now, we want to give you the opportunity to surrender your life to Jesus. You need to know that you are loved. God loves you so much and you are invited to be part of his kingdom. So today is your day. This is your time, your opportunity to give your life to Jesus. Just surrender your heart and say this prayer after Pastor Dave. Jesus, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I turn from my old life. I turn from my old life. I apologize for the things I've done wrong. I apologize for the things I've done wrong. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Today, Lord Jesus. Today, Lord Jesus. I accept you as my saviour. I accept you as my saviour. I turn from my old life. I turn from my old life. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Lord. And I receive your new birth. And I receive your new birth. Right now. Right now. I'm born again. I'm born again. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. My name's in your book. My name is in your book. And I'm going to follow you from this day forward. I'm going to follow you from this day forward. And I'm asking in Jesus' name. And I'm asking in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just let me pray for you. Father, I pray today for everybody that said that prayer for the mm -hmm. first time and really meant it or the hundredth time and really mm -hmm. meant it. Yes. And I pray today, Father, that a miracle would take place in their heart right now that they be born again mm. in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. And if that's you today, remember to tell somebody it's so, so important. And as we conclude today, Rosanna's going to remind you about some great things coming up this week. We have a meeting Wednesday for the men at 3 o'clock in the afternoon at Andrew's house outside. And on Wednesday evening, 7.30, we have a worship team zoom meeting amen that's going to be great i'm oh, looking forward yeah. to that and in the meantime keep ringing people encouraging them yeah. pray for one another lead someone to jesus think about who should get saved and start praying for their salvation because we'll look forward to seeing you during the week on facebook with some great bible studies some good teaching on there and on our youtube and we are looking forward to seeing you at next week's online church service. God bless you. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.